<laughs> well, it's, it's great to be here this evening, and uh, there must not be much going on tonight for you all to show up here. <laughs> but uh, I'm off to a, a, a really great start. I was standing up uh, at the entrance a while ago and uh, saw a familiar face, and I turn around, and it's Dr. Mary Wixton over here. Mary, <laughs> raise your hand. Uh, Mary and I uh, have spent some time offshore, and she is one of the premier uh, invertebrate, uh, marine invertebrate uh, biologists uh, in the world. And then I came up, and I sat down next to this lovely lady right here, and I looked over, and I said, my gosh, that's Dr. Pat Suter. And I tapped her on the arm, and she looks at me and says, do I know you? <laughs> You didn't, but you do now. <laughs> so I hope I didn't frighten you too much. Um, so it, it's, it's great to be here, and it's always really a neat experience when I come back into College Station. I was only here for a year, and that was in 1982, and it has changed substantially <laughs> since, since then. I, I actually had to call and ask for directions when I came in. You know, where am I? <laughs> but once we made the big square, it all starts to come back to me. But... Uh, I was here for the opening of the uh, George, George Bush uh, Museum's uh, exhibit on offshore oil and gas industry uh, was about two months ago, I believe, and very impressive, very impressive. And I want to thank uh, Mr. Finch, where'd you go? Over here, uh, for inviting me and this opportunity and uh, a great dinner we had a moment ago, so that was excellent. Um, as a researcher, uh, I, I've been putting around in the Gulf of Mexico, Gulf of Mexico since about 1969. Uh, I made my first scuba dive uh, on a platform uh, off the lower Texas coast in, uh, I think it was June of 69, and since then I have made countless uh, dives out there. I've been floating around out there ever since uh, for one reason or another. I was just fortunate I could always find somebody pay pay me to do it, so because I was going to do it anyway, pay or no pay. But uh, one of the great things, and it, it was an event of unintended consequences, the first oil and gas production platform was put offshore off Louisiana coast in about 1947. Uh, nobody anticipated uh, the reef development. Uh, that was going to occur, reef development uh, being a, a collection of living organisms uh, in a habitat, an ecosystem, uh, working through it, and they quickly became favorite uh, fishing locations uh, for the local fishermen. And we, nobody really paid much attention what their overall impact upon the Gulf of Mexico. Well, from 1947 to today, there have been over 4,000 of these structures put on the Gulf of Mexico continental shelf. Uh, and we'll run through the whys, wares, and somebody told me how to do this. Um, well, I know this works. So when we look at a, um, an artificial reef program, we're really talking about a program that trying to improve upon nature. Uh, nature just in its, its natural state is almost not always at its most productive state. And then there's going to be a lot of people say, what do you mean prove upon nature? Nature's perfect as it is. Um, yeah, when there's no people, uh, nature is perfect as it is. But if we look at other activities where we work to improve upon nature, certainly farmland, that's not its natural state. We have taken a natural natural habitats and modify them to be the most productive as we possibly can uh, to, to meet demands for uh, nutrients, foods. Ranch land, same thing. Ranch land is not natural habitat. We put a dam across the river, we're changing habitat again. We're trying to improve upon nature to meet the demands and needs of the human populace. Uh, highways, you know, it, it, we're, we're, everything we do we're changing and trying to improve upon nature. And that's, that's the whole philosophy behind an artificial reef. We can take and increase the production of the natural system. Now, with no people, so what? We don't need that. But we've got a global growing population, and that population has to have food. It has to have energy resources, uh, biological energy resources, nutrients. Uh, we've got to somehow use what nature has given us to get to that point. If we look at the Gulf of Mexico, 
when I was a kid, if somebody had a 12-foot boat with a 10, 10 horsepower motor on it, on any given block, they were high rollers. Now every other house has got a, 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 an 18 or 20-foot boat with a 200-horse engine on it, and everybody wants to be able to catch their fish, get out there and catch their fish. Uh, so we're always looking for ways to meet the growing demand. So again, why are we improving ball nature? We, we make life possible. How do we support nine billion people on planet Earth? It's not going to. Nature can't do it by itself. Nature cannot do it in its natural state. Um, and the demands, the demands are growing. There's one thing that I can tell you about people that I'm absolutely convinced that I'm right is that every person on planet Earth gets up every morning with the sole intent of sustaining and improving their quality of life. That's what we all do. Uh, we live in a country, you know, our, our blessings are just unbelievable. Um, and we are the great consumers of natural resources per capita four times more than any other country. Every other country aspires to be like us. So that just gives you a growing demands on the resources. Whether you look at the, the great populations of China, India, uh, the countries of Africa, they're all trying to find ways to access the natural resources, which means we have got to be able to improve upon nature. Habitat integrity and diversity is certainly essential to protecting infrastructure. We see that on the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, every time a storm comes through, you hear people talking about uh, uh, the, the need for barrier islands, the need for oyster reefs to help mitigate the, the storm surges coming through. Uh, public health is certainly, I, I had someone told me once, you know, we can drill an oil well in a cesspool. And I said, well, you certainly can, but could you and your kids live in it? No. So we, we've got to look at public health. We've got to maintain our environment, our habitat integrity uh, to ensure that we have a healthy environment to achieve that, that quality of life we all aspire to. Economic sustainability. Uh, right now we have a perfect example. The state of Louisiana, the Louisiana wetlands are eroding away. That was predicted in 1840 when they decided to dike and dam the Mississippi River. Uh, going to be billions and billions and billions of economic uh, upheaval over this. And again, I go back to the statement of quality of life. Artificial reef theory is, is very simple. Uh, the reef itself is not artificial. It's just the structure that it's built upon is man-made or artificial. Uh, the reef is natural in every sense. But more hard structure and surface areas equal more macro and micro habitats that produces more biomass and biodiversity which produces a healthier and more productive ecosystem. Again, very simple. And uh, Humans being humans, we try to complicate everything. Uh, reef dynamics, I'll just jump on this. This is an awful busy uh, presentation here. But a reef, whether it be a natural reef or an artificial reef, my assessment is that it becomes a natural productive reef when we have photic energy coming into it. We have biological energy, that's, that's flesh, tissue, stuff that's being eaten. That's energy and nutrients being transferred from one trophic level to another. Uh, we've got active recruitment, passive recruitment. And then once it gets onto the reef system through the food web and reproduction, it diversifies this energy and nutrients into different forms, different species. And then through reproduction, it begins to export those same in nutrients and energy. They have just been converted from one form of energy and nutrient to another. When we sit down and eat a hamburger, that's exactly what we're doing. We're taking in biological, either through the plants, through the animal. We're taking it in, we're converting it into our tissues. And then through reproduction, we will eventually pass it on through uh, to another 
level. So if you look at these offshore structures, they very much are doing this. They're increasing biodiversity. They're increasing biomass. And they're exporting it to the wider Gulf of Mexico. Attraction, if you follow the, the science uh, discussions, uh, the environmental discussions on platform structures in the Gulf of Mexico, somebody, attraction, are we just attracting stuff or are we actually producing new, new biomass, new, new species? We're doing both. And, and, and that's, that's, that's a debate that's a complete and total waste of time. Yes, we're creating new biomass. Now, where this originated early on was that resource managers, National Marine Fisheries, Texas Parks and Wildlife, they initially started out wanting to assess the value of an artificial reef based on about five species of fish, those that had recreational or commercial fishing um, value, dollar value. Well, that's completely and totally wrong way to do it. You've got to look at the invertebrates, the fouling community, all the photosynthesis that's going on through the algae that, that's uh, attaching to the structure. Uh, you've got to look at all of these little critters that you'll never see because they're there, but they are a, an intricate part of the overall ecosystem of the food webs of the Gulf of Mexico. So yes, attraction versus production. A big shark comes in and eats a little fish and swims away. <laughs> That reef attracted that shark, he consumed some energy and nutrients, and he took it back out. And somewhere along the line, something will consume him or her. Um, so it's a very dynamic system. Now, here's the map. It, it shows the concentration uh, of uh, uh, the, artifact or the platform structures in the Gulf of Mexico over, over time. Now, as the picture is a little bit misleading because we just could not make a dot small enough to represent a platform. Uh, you've got plenty of plenty of room out there to drive your boat around. You're not going to just be running into them and uh, next door and, and what have you, uh, such as this. But there you can see the distribution of these structures uh, over time. Certainly they were much concentrated uh, off of Louisiana, Texas, Florida. Uh, nothing. The Floridians have and continue to very aggressively uh, uh, resist any type of uh, oil and gas uh, exploration production off their waters. Um, they, they fear that uh, it, it would affect their tourist industry, but their tourist industry runs on oil and gas. You know, I, I have people tell me, challenge me all the time, how can you, as a conservationist, work with the oil and gas industry? And my question or my response to that always is, in this room, and I'll throw it out to you guys, show me any one thing in here that does not have oil and gas energy or hydrocarbon chemistry in it. Here's a clue. You can't. So the next question is, okay, what are you willing to give up? Nobody wants to give up anything. We want it all. Um, so right there is a conundrum that we face in, in dealing with our energy sources. So artificial reef management issues. Certainly what is the purpose of an artificial reef? Um, what is the type? Where is it going? How is it going to factor into fisheries management? Um, can artificial reef zones be used as marine protected areas to create protected uh, schools, communities that they're not fished, they're just allowed to go through their reproductive cycles and food webs as normal? Uh, certainly we need to study and monitor the artificial reefs. We don't know near enough about them as of yet. What's the liability? Uh, Certainly from the owners, that's always the big issue. Uh, what's, our, what's our liability? We, we live in a very litigious society. What's our liability on these things? And what do they cost? Uh, various uh, artificial reef materials, certainly there, there's a company that makes what they call reef balls out of cement. Uh, scrap metal structures, surplus war materials off Alabama. They, they dumped like 30 
World War II Army tanks uh, in the ocean uh, as reef material. Florida, good golly, Florida, they put airliners, big, you know, 737s on the bottom and call them artificial reefs for the dive community. Um, uh, Warren was telling me that he has a cousin who has a contract to clean scrap automobiles and, and other ships uh, to be sunk off Florida as artificial reefs. Um, and then oil and gas platform jackets. Now, I, I've been all around the world looking at artificial reefs and what have you. And there is, again, unintended, but there is no material any better than a platform jacket as an artificial reef. It reaches has high vertical relief. It reaches up to the water surface, all the way down to the seabed. It's got all types of internal volume to it. Uh, they're just amazing. Uh, commercial and recreational fisheries, the seafood industries in the Gulf of Mexico, we had a dinner of red snapper a while ago. I guarantee you we would not have been eating red snapper if it weren't for these platform-based reefs in the Gulf of Mexico. These reefs, according to uh, Dr. Robert Shipp of the University of Southern Alabama, has increased the number of red snapper in the Gulf of Mexico by tenfold. Um, and we talk, we hear a lot of debate, a lot of push back and forth between recreational fishers and the commercial fishers. Well, yeah, there are more recreational fishers. They spend a lot of money. But their catch does not go to the restaurant so that I can go in there and order red snapper on the plate. And then when you take and you factor in all the employees of these seafood restaurants, how that factors in the tourist industry. They're both monumental. They're the two biggest industries uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. There is a catch of uh, red snapper. I guarantee you those fish were caught off a platform structure somewhere. Um, and if you're a recreational fisherman, that was a good day. <laughs> so, and it's even a better day if you got somebody to clean it all for you. So, <laughs> that's that's always my what inhibits me from being a fisherman. I've got to clean the things. So, um, I'll just run through some photos here, give you an idea of what it looks like. Uh, here's a platform structure. This is actually a platform structure that's still in production. But the photographer is looking up the leg, and above the water, you can see the, uh, the upper structure above the water. But you see all that growth. And Mary can tell you what everything on there is. So <laughs> if, if you want to know, corner her afterwards. Uh, you, you look through here. This gives you some idea. This picture I took just last week, you can see some idea of the complexity beneath uh, the fish congregation. Spawning, you know, we have spent hours and hours and hours observing spawning of fish uh, on these on these reefs. Uh, th there's there's another photo, and here I, I threw this one in just to kind of emphasize that sunlight. You look in the upper right hand corner and you see the brightness of the sun coming in. We can't ever overlook the role of photosynthesis in these reefs, whether it be a reef based on a platform. A coral reef, photosynthesis makes it all work. Uh, just showing you a, a little bit of difference here. This is a, uh, one of my students uh, back then. Uh, um, he, he Tragically, we lost Carl, but um, Dr. Carl Beaver. And this was perhaps the first dive he ever went with me on a structure, a platform structure. And here we are up in the shallow waters of the, the upper end, the up shallow part of the reef. You see how clear and all of this. We go down to the bottom and we get into what's called the nephloid layer. And I throw this in just to give you some idea of how complex and different uh, the habitats and, and the water conditions and the, um, vary over, over vertically as well as horizontally across the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, here uh, is just a photo I, I took on a, a structure. Uh, I can't read the depth gauge there, but uh, that's probably 10, 15 feet deep. Uh, here we are. That looks like about 20 feet. You see the sponges. Uh, growing here. 
Then you get down, uh, we're at about 194 feet, and you see again the difference, uh, the zonation, the different organisms as you move deeper in, into the water column uh, with these. Um, some little isolated corals uh, such as this. Uh, now, hermatypic corals, these are corals that actually build reefs. You find them on these structures. But because everything else grows so much faster, the sponges, the hydroids, the bryozoans, they cover them over before they can actually form a reef itself. Uh, you can dig down through and find uh, uh, skeletal remains of, of a lot of the uh, hermatypic corals on this. Flatworms, again, just emphasizing the, the biodiversity. Uh, this, this, is, this is interesting here. Uh, we're on a platform in, in what they call the East Breaks block. And the water depth there is about 900 feet. And we're only about 80 feet here. Obviously, we can't get down 900 feet. But a clutch of spiny lobster had settled out somewhere. And uh, the, the, these animals, they, they were full, fully adults. Some of them were gravid, carrying eggs. Uh, and we left them, left them there just to watch them over time. Uh, then a research crew came through and cleaned them all off and cooked them. Uh, I, I called, uh, I knew there was a group out of Florida, and I called BP actually on the platform. And I called the Houston headquarters of BP and was raising cane with them. How did you let them do this? Well, we didn't let them do that. So they called the group out in Florida, and I mean, just read them the right act. <laughs> you think you're ever going to have another consulting job out here? Not like this, you're not. Um, now, interesting enough, that company is now one of the biggest uh, environmental consultants worldwide. Um, spiny oysters. Um, we used to collect these. Uh, once you clean all the sponges and all the uh, epiphytes off of it, uh, we used to collect these. They were in great demand, a beautiful shell, beautiful. Great demand uh, by collectors. <laughs> Again, I'm just running through some of the diversity. What pe most people don't understand, most of the Gulf of Mexico is tropical. We all go to the beach, we see what's around the beach. Uh, shallow, sandy, muddy water. That, that's only a very small part of the Gulf of Mexico. You get out offshore and you get into this. Uh, here, here's a uh, spot fin butterfly on a platform out there. And that's one thing that these reefs, as, as they were put in, they allowed the tropicals, they created s uh, static habitat. It wasn't going anywhere in water quality that was consistent year-round. And so a lot of the tropicals were able to move further north into the Gulf of Mexico and establish uh, uh, breeding populations. Uh, here a blue angel. Uh, a shark uh, with rainbow runners uh, following it. This is a silky shark, and we, we sometimes we'd run into schools, 300 of these, huge schools, all female aggregations. And I don't know if you're familiar with the shark skin, but shark, the skin of a shark is what they call dermal denticles. It's teeth, and they all point backwards. And so what these smaller fish were doing, they would swim up and rub against the shark rubbing parasites off themselves, just tormenting the heck out of this shark. Now this basket that you see there, that's how we would get in and out of the water. And so when it set us in the water, we'd drop into this. And, you know, everybody was just thinking, okay, what's going to eat me uh, type deal. And uh, one night, we were in the water at night, and it was just flat glass slick. And, I mean, it was just a cauldron of fish every time the basket would hit the water. Boom, shark, barracuda, amberjack, big fish just shooting through. And I got down to the last guy in the water because we could only go up two at a time. And so the last guy in the water with me, I point and tell him it's his, his turn to go up. He goes, uh-uh, <laughs> he's not going through that. And so he actually went over and an old uh, ladder on the side of the platform, climbed up that ladder, got up, walked, oh, it's at least 100 feet up flights of stairs, up to the upper deck with all of his gear on, but he wasn't going to swim through the sharks and everything. Uh, African pompano, uh, another beautiful animal. Uh, look downs. You get into the macro photography, you get a lot of little little guys like this. They're just 
Uh, you, you hate to uh, anthropomorphize uh, on these animals, but this guy's got character. I mean, you look at him, he's just an hey, you want to party? Um, the yellow here, you know, there's some downsides. Uh, the yellow that you see, that's orange cup coral. It's an invasive species out of uh, the Indo-Pacific. And it came over via ship, no doubt, or barge of some type. But it is all over out there now. It's just very successful. There's a close-up uh, of it. Um, beautiful animal. We have no idea what its effect or impact could be or is, but uh, so far, nothing that we've been able to see. Uh, the white, snowy-looking stuff, that's a tunicate. Uh, it's another invasive species. And it was all over out there for two or three years, and that's disappeared. Uh, it's just gone. Um, yeah, you can abuse the fishing opportunities here. This, this boat was actually out there engaged in what they call finning, finning sharks. Uh, those silky sharks, you can see one laying up on the deck. They'd pull them up, cut the fins off, throw the fish back over. Uh, the fins would all go to Korea, China, Hong Kong. Uh, it's against the law. But we actually filmed this and and turned it in to the uh, Coast Guard and National Marine Fisheries. Whether they did anything with it or not, I don't know, but uh, we, we did turn it in. Uh, monitoring studies, again, there, there's, we know a lot. We know absolutely that these structures, these reefs, are a very viable and productive part of the Gulf of Mexico ecosystem, but there is so much that we don't know, um, and we need to be working on that. Challenges, certainly regulatory. This floors me. It takes six federal agency to sign off on every permit to create an artificial reef. Six. And any one of them could do it. But because of how their missions are stated and codified in the Federal Register and all of this, they've all got to have a role in it. Economic. Um, you know, I'd like to say that the oil and gas companies participate in this because of a, a charitable nature. Um, that's not it. Uh, they participate when it's economically to their advantage to participate. So we have to work quite with them. Societal, uh, I guarantee you there, there's folks out there right now that say we want it all taken out and we want the seabed swept clean. We'd rather have it just be a flat mud bottom like nature created. Uh, there was a book just recently put out by two authors, one from Florida, one from California, saying exactly that. And you've got to ask yourself, how could somebody that puts jet airliners on the seabed be saying get rid of this? You know, it, 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 you got to look at the motivations and wonder about some of this. Uh, real quick, the Gulf of Mexico Foundation, uh, artificial reefs not the only thing we work on. Uh, we're very much uh, engaged in a habitat restoration. They tell me there's some red dots on that map. Uh, my color deficiency, I can't see them. But if you can see red, you ought to see red across the five Gulf states and down in the Caribbean, U.S. Gulf states. And we could add to that now Mexico, uh, where we've worked on habitat restorations. We work on building partnerships uh, throughout. Uh, in a lot of our projects, we've had well over 50,000 uh, contributed volunteer hours. Uh, we work with communities. Uh, the, the bottom right picture there, the young women celebrating we just handed them a check for I, I don't know ten twenty thousand dollars and it was in Puerto Rico and I swear they thought they won the lottery uh, so and it makes us feel good to be able to go out and do that uh, we work on a lot of uh, in policy issues technology development sediment management uh, what do we do with sediment uh, uh, as it's all dredged out of ports and harbors uh, where does it go um, and the whole objective is to reverse all the downward trends in habitat and ecosystem services. If we're going to live, work, and play in the coastal zone, we are dependent upon those ecosystem services. And right now, they're, they're all on a negative trend line. And we've got to get that uh, up and going. We have incorporated our, our 
organization in Mexico now. We've We've worked in Mexico for a uh, long, long time, but we went ahead and, and s officially set up offices in Mexico. Uh, policy changes, uh, that'll bore you to tears, so I won't even run through it. Uh, but we, we do a lot of work with policy. Uh, I've sat on at least two uh, federal advisory boards and have just recently was uh, appointed to another one. Sea level rise. We've done a lot of modeling, supported a lot of modeling on sea level rise around the Gulf Coast. We're all pretending like it's not happening. It's happening. Um, and no mat matter how many times you put it up on the table, it all gets pushed back under the table pretty quick. But if you live on the coast, you better be aware of it. Uh, beneficial use of sediments. Dredging is primarily done by the U.S. Corps of Engineers, and they, they work on a least cost model. And usually the least cost when they dredge up sediment is to pump it offshore into the uh, Mississippi Canyon where it will never be seen again on land. Um, and that's not always the best use of it. And we can use it uh, to replace erosion, to counteract erosion and build other habitats. Um, we're working on assessment of changing ecosystem services uh, uh, in Galveston Bay. Teachers programs down under out yonder, if you, if you look at the picture on the right, upper right, uh, those are teachers and they're from all over the United States. And every year we take them, a group, a selected group out to the flower garden banks and teach them about coral reef ecology. The bottom left is another group of teachers uh, from all over the United States. Uh, we take them uh, on a trip up and down the intercoastal waterway where we really look at coastal habitats and the interaction between what we do living, working, and playing in the coastal zone with the natural environment. Uh, both of these are award-winning programs, our student programs. Uh, believe me, there's more demand out there than we could ever meet uh, for student programs. We're right now, we're working, we're developing a, uh, a facility in Galveston, a Habitat Restoration Technology Center. Uh, Seven million dollar facility. I've got half the money raised, I'm looking for the other half. The Sea Wave Expedition, we're looking on bringing an expedition vessel into the Gulf of Mexico, working with the uh, oil and gas industry uh, on this. And a lot of this is about communication. The Gulf of Mexico is just not the coastal zone. Two-thirds of the continental United States drain into the Gulf of Mexico. Half of Mexico drains into the Gulf of Mexico. We have U.S., Mexico, Cuba, uh, Honduras, all have a role in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, it's international and the communications have to reach out. And part of it is we cannot say, okay, we're going to protect the northern half and not give the same attention to the southern half because you cannot protect just part of it and expect to save the whole. It just will not work. And we must plan for our grandchildren's grandchildren. Uh, that's one of the things that's it's really, you know, we all get up every day. Like I say, okay, how do I sustain and improve my quality of life? And today it's hard to even have a thought about 10 years from now, 20 years, or two generations from now. But it's estimated that a child born in this country today, over 50% of them will live past 100 years. That means they're going to be up and kicking in 2114. That's one generation. And you look at the changes we've seen in our lifetime. Do you realize the Wright brothers flew in, let's see, the Wright brothers flew in 1903. Then it was, what, 60, is 59 years later that John Glenn orbited the Earth? In just 59 years. From flying at Kitty Hawk to circling the Earth in a rocket. That's how fast the world's changing today. So, you know, as we look at this, I can guarantee you I'm going to live out the rest of my life in relative comfort I experience now. But what about my, I have a brand new grandbaby. What about him? Um, what about your grandkids? Your children? So think about it when you look at how we can improve upon nature.